Welcome, dear listeners, to Horror Den of Misfits. Story time. This may end up being a long post, so sorry in advance. This is the first time I have shared what happened to a buddy and I a few years ago. We promised not to say anything, but I figured I could post it here without people thinking we were crazy. So a few years ago I was 23 at the time, my best friend returned home from Afghanistan. He was or is a marine and had been away for almost a year. We always talked about going hunting when he returned, and so when returned in late November we made plans to go to my hunting camp during the Christmas break. Since I was still in college and he was going to be starting school in the spring, we each had a little less than a month of freedom to do what we wanted. We decided to stay at my camp house for a solid week to hunt and drink beer. It was late December in the south so it was cold but not terrible, but it was overcast almost every day. One particularly cloudy day we decided to go hunting in the afternoon to see if we couldn't kill a white-tailed deer or a hog. We were hunting in two different areas so I dropped my friend off at his stand at 1 pm and drove the short distance to my stand. As a crow flies I was maybe 200-300 yards away from him when sitting in my stand. The afternoon passed by with no luck, I had not seen a single animal. Not even a bird. I thought this was odd but honestly it was kind of bad weather so I wasn't that put off by it, I just figured all the creatures were hunkered down for the night. As the sun began to set I decided to leave the stand a little bit early so I could be there when my buddy decided to stop hunting for the evening. I made the trek back to my car, and as I was about to get in I heard a blood-curdling scream coming from the area where my buddy was hunting. I guess scream is not the best word to describe it, it was more of a war cry. If you have ever seen the movie Full Metal Jacket and remember the part when the drill sergeant asks to hear Joker's battle cry, that was the noise I heard. Not knowing what was going on possibly my friend fell and hurt himself, or was just ready to go and trying to signal me I hopped in the car and cranked it. Then I heard the first shot. Quickly followed by number 2, 3, 4. I quit counting and began driving to my friend's position. I was driving like a bat out of hell, but could still hear my friend firing away with his rifle and continuing to yell through my open car window. About halfway to the stand I had to slam on the brakes to keep from hitting my friend. There he was standing in the middle of the road with his back to me. I could then see he had both of his pistols drawn and pointing at the woods about 30 yards in front of him. His rifle lay at his feet. Empty. I grabbed my 1911 my flashlight, and exited the vehicle slowly. As I approached my friend I could see that he was shaking, but he never broke eye contact with the area of the woods where he was pointing his sidearms. Since he had just returned from Afghanistan, I approached him slowly thinking he may be having a flashback or something PTSD related. Granted I had never seen this from him since he returned, but he was a marine and I wasn't taking any chances. Once I got closer I asked calmly, Thomas, are you okay? No answer he never even acknowledged I was there. Never broke eye contact with the woods. Again I asked, Thomas, what's up, is everything alright, it's Bishop. What were you shooting at? This time I finally got a response, though not to the questions I was asking, Thomas replied, do you see it? As he nodded to point with his head at the area of woods. At this point the sun had set, but there was still just enough sunlight to brighten the sky. It was then I finally decided to look at the place where he was aiming, and all I could see was shadows, but one of the shadows seemed to be moving as they tend to do in the twilight, so I lifted my stinger flashlight and pointed it towards the woods. I then saw what my friend had seen, and this still gives me chills when I think about it. But back in the woods maybe 5 yards off the road, but 35 yards or so from us was a set of red eyes. The eyes were maybe 7 feet off the ground and right next to a tree. I kind of chuckled to myself at the time, believing it to be a possum or a raccoon hanging on to the side of the tree I told my friend, it's nothing man it's just a raccoon or something, Thomas quickly retorted, that ain't no raccoon. To prove him wrong I took aim with my 45, right between the two red eyes and pulled the trigger. As soon as I fired the eyes disappeared. But I didn't hear the thud of an animal dropping to the ground, instead all I heard was this thing scampering through the leaves towards us. The thing did not come directly towards us though, 
it was still maybe five yards deep in the woods, but had advanced much closer. I pointed my light towards the area where I heard it stop and again, there was the two red eyes about seven feet off the ground on another tree. Now I started to get creeped out because any normal animal would have hauled ass away. I tapped on my friend's shoulder and said, let's get the F out of here. He picked up his rifle, holstering one sidearm and back towards the truck. I did the same, not wanting to take my eyes off this thing. I finally reached my car after what seemed like an eternity and broke eye contact to get in. When I picked my head back up, the eyes were now on the side of the road just feet from where we were standing, but now they were hovering behind some foliage at a height of maybe 4 feet. I told my buddy not to lose sight of it, and to keep his gun ready, he nodded in agreement. I put the car in reverse and began to back down the road when the most evil cackle rang out from the woods. At this point Thomas began to talk, dude, go faster, go faster, go faster damn it. I pushed the gas pedal as far down as it would go, and we were rocketing down this dirt road in reverse. When we reached the main road, I quickly whipped my truck around and slammed it into drive. It was in this split second between transitioning from reverse to drive that I glanced out my window down the dirt road we had just come from. I still cannot be certain of what I saw, but through the dirt and dust, through the darkness of twilight I could make out a figure moving towards us rapidly. It seemed to be made of darkness, it was very lanky like if you were to wrap black cloth around a skeleton. But it was not human, it was kind of hunched over at legs and running like a human doing a sneaky run. I broke eye contact and looked forward as we were now speeding off in that direction. I breathed a sigh of relief as we reached the main highway and began the drive back to the camp. Shortly thereafter we began discussing what the F had just happened. I asked, what the F was that thing, Thomas replied, I don't know what it is, but I know what the locals called it. I looked at my friend puzzled, you mean you have seen this thing before? The locals called it many things but the most common was gull. After talking for a while he related the story behind his first encounter with this thing. But in the interest of keeping this story short I will save that for next time. We have not shared this story because honestly who would believe it. All I can say is that this thing is real, and shooting at it seems to have no effect. If you have encountered something similar please feel free to share, and if you know how to kill it, I know one marine that would love to know how. Part 2 in the first post I mentioned that my friend had previous experience with this thing. Throughout his deployment he and his squad had many encounters with it, some worse than others. But as all stories go, you have to understand the events that lead up to this point in time. Some details have to be left out of this story because it would potentially put my friend in danger. More on that aspect in a later post. My buddy was deployed to Afghanistan in late 2007, he was stationed in the southeast region of the country in the mountains. I'm afraid to even mention the number of people in his outpost for fear of it being tracked back to him, but it was a decent size. Within a month or so of being there my friend became accustomed to firefights. It was a contested area and the insurgents would often fire at the base or attack the local villagers. After one brutal attack on the local village, my friend and his squad began patrolling this area to protect the civilians. It did not take long for the insurgents to notice this, and one day they decided to ambush my buddy and his squad. For the sake of keeping this short, during the firefight the son of the village elder decided to walk out of his house and investigate with his AK-47 in his hands. Thinking he was one of the insurgents they shot him and killed him. Now I could go into further detail here, but I trust my friend when he said it was an accident. When the fight ended my friend had the responsibility of going with a translator to tell the elder what happened to his son. Needless to say the man was very upset and began yelling at my friend. Their translator told him to walk away and that he would console the old man. A few minutes later the translator walks back to the squad and says, time to leave. Figuring everything was gonna be okay they began to walk away. In the background they could hear the old man half sobbing half yelling at them. They returned to base with no further confrontation, and did what all marines like to do, they went to go get some grub. While they were eating my buddy noticed their translator had been oddly quiet the entire time, and was not eating like the rest of them. Thomas approached the man and asked him what was wrong. The translator stared blankly at Thomas for an uncomfortable piece of time before finally saying, 
we're cursed. Thomas chuckled a bit because until this time he had no reason to fear such things, but he soon would. Upon further questioning the translator told them that the village elder had put a curse on them, and until he lifted it the gull would be after them. The squad thought nothing of it, screwed around playing cards for a while and went to sleep. When Thomas awoke the next morning he was exhausted. He hadn't slept much at all that night because he kept having strange nightmares and was just generally restless. Again Thomas ignored this and began his regular routine until he noticed everyone had the same experience that night. None of his squad mates had slept well either and most like him, had nightmares all night. Even the translator had a tough evening, and it was the translator who suggested they go back to the village and ask the old man to lift the curse since he is the only one who could do so. Thomas and his boys went out on patrol as usual and decided to follow the translator's advice and head up to the village. Upon arriving they found that everyone in the village had been killed during the night by the insurgents, including the old man. Fast forward a couple weeks, Thomas and his squad are out on patrol at night, looking for insurgents who had been moving guns and supplies through the area. This was their first encounter with the thing. Thomas was just walking along when a guy in front of him begins firing into the brush and trees. Immediately Thomas began firing at the area too and moved to a better position. There was no return fire. No muzzle flashes from the enemy like you would expect to see. Quickly the ceasefire was ordered and Thomas went to talk to the soldier who had started firing in the first place. When asked what he was shooting at the soldier uttered an all too familiar phrase, I don't know. Thomas began to yell a bit and said, what do you mean you don't know? You just fired off at an unidentified target. What the soldier said freaked Thomas out, no sir I saw something, I just don't know how to explain it. It wasn't human but it was no animal I know of the instant the soldier said. No animal I know of Thomas caught a glimpse of something moving about 300 yards out. It was obscured by bushes but Thomas could make out two red eyes looking back at him. Thomas then alerted the rest of the squad and took a shot at the red eyes. They went out but quickly reappeared behind more brush, except it was about 150 yards out. They then got the sniper to take a shot at it with his 50 cal. Again the eyes disappeared but then reappeared even closer. They then called for air support but no assets were in the area. Thomas decided to launch a grenade at the thing, and this is when it turned bad. Once the dust settled from the explosion of the grenade Thomas could make out the figure directly in front of them, but within 100 yards and closing fast. The squad immediately began laying down fire and performing a bounding retreat. They had gone maybe 50 yards when they noticed someone was missing and they also noticed the figure with the two red eyes was nowhere to be seen. They called in for support to look for the missing soldier and a helicopter was dispatched from a base nearby. They advanced back to where they had last seen the soldier and could find nothing. The helicopter even scanned the area for heat signatures, but could not find anything, not even a blood trail. The soldier had just vanished. Upon returning to base the entire squad was debriefed, and forced to sign a non-disclosure agreement, and was told to repeat none of this to the rest of the soldiers in the outpost. The Marine was never found and was falsely classified as KIA. They had a few more encounters with this thing before their tour was over, but that is another story. Side note after posting the first story I told Thomas that I had posted it and wanted to post the rest of his story. He was uneasy at first but eventually relented as long as I would promise not to pass along any details that could identify him. He is in constant contact with the rest of his squad mates, and every single one of them has seen this thing upon returning home from Afghanistan, but they have also begun to notice they are being followed by someone. Black SUVs with blacked out windows always parked somewhere nearby. They know something. Part 3 it had been a rough time for Thomas and the gang after the events of the last story. Thomas had some of the most horrible nightmares. Most of them revolved around him being in the middle of the woods or some vast expanse of land, it would be nighttime and he would be freezing cold. It was there he would encounter the thing and wake up terrified. The strange thing was the similarity between the dreams Thomas would have and the dreams the rest of the squad would talk about. Each person had a unique dream, but the one factor shared amongst all these different dreams was the presence of the thing. 
one night roughly three weeks after the first incident was the second encounter with this entity. Thomas was on watch with another soldier, which he didn't mind too much since he hadn't been sleeping well anyways. Thomas and the other soldier talked a while about their dreams and how odd it was that they had never found any signs of the soldier that went missing. For the most of the night it was quiet and Thomas just sat there smoking a cig looking out into the darkness and listening for any signs of movement. The night passed without a hitch until about 2 am when Thomas heard the other soldier say, no way Thomas hadn't been paying attention and didn't notice that the other soldier had stopped scanning the horizon with the NV scope and instead was focused on one particular area. Thomas replied inquisitively, what? To which the other soldier just said, take a look. Thomas raised up his rifle to use his own scope and quickly was able to see what looked like a soldier on the side of the mountain across from where their base was located. Unable to make any more detail because of the distance Thomas went to get a sniper rifle that had a much better and much more powerful scope attached. He was making the return trip when he heard the other soldier start whisper yelling his name. Thomas quickened his pace and made it back to the watch post. Thomas quickly set the rifle up on the sandbags and asked again, what is it? But his question was soon answered. When he focused the rifle on the area where he had seen the soldier, he saw it again except this time the eyes that haunted his dreams were there peering back. Red eyes seeming to seep out from underneath this shell of a soldier. Thomas sat there watching this thing for what he said, seemed like an eternity before it began to move. It did not travel up or down the mountain but to the side. Thomas watched it all the way, but just before leaving eyesight and moving to the other side of the mountain the thing turned, stared right at him and waved. Thomas shuddered and took his eyes off his scope. When he peered back through, the thing was gone. The rest of the night passed without incident and Thomas was put at ease. That is until they found the body of the missing soldier on the other side of the mountain the next day. No eyes, no bones, no organs, just a shell. I'm not a hunter anymore. Something had been tearing Culver's cows clean open. Just a long slash, utter to throat. Anything that wasn't eaten was spilled out onto the pasture. He reckoned wolves and I was inclined to agree. I never saw anything quite like it in all my years of hunting, but what else but a wolf could do that to a cow? He hired me to see about it, and frankly I was happy for any job. Wolves can be a challenge, even for someone like me. They're sly for one. You can be standing right next to a wolf and never know it. You also have to be careful not to alert Big Brother about what you're up to. They let those bastards loose all over the place, then act like a man's in the wrong for protecting his own livelihood. That's why I like to take an infrared camera with me when I hunt down wolves. Yeah, it's cheating a little I know. But a fella needs to be aware of all that's around him in cases like that, no matter if they walk on two legs or four. It was dawn when I set out from Culver's pasture, armed with a sufficiently powered rifle and the infrared camera hanging around my neck. A frost had settled in, which had the contradictory effect of dampening the sounds of the forest and amplifying my footsteps on the leaves. I felt a chill run through me and blamed it on the cold. I knew these woods well enough that the quiet didn't bother me, but something about that morning had me feeling on edge. Maybe it was the shape those cows had been in. Maybe it was the lack of birdsong. Probably it was the most recent news about this place. Some college kid from the city, hopped up on who knows what, had stabbed his buddy to death on a camping trip. When they found him, he just kept screaming that he'd killed a monster. Not that I believed in monsters, mind you. It's the people you have to worry about. Crazies of all stripes in the world, believe you me. I'd been out in the woods maybe an hour when I saw the first deer. It was a doe laid out on her side and ripped wide open. I raised my infrared camera and scanned the area for any heat signatures. Nothing. I was about to move on from the doe when it occurred to me that something was wrong. Even though she had obviously been killed by a predator, she hadn't been eaten. The tear down her belly was clean, and she was otherwise completely intact. There were not even any signs of scavengers or carrion birds. A shiver ran down my spine and I unconsciously touched my gun. Maybe the wolf had been spooked and abandoned its kill I thought. But that didn't quite explain the complete lack of predation. I licked my lips and looked around again. The eerie quiet still lingered in the forest, 
Not even the rustle of squirrels darting in the underbrush disrupted the stillness. All I could hear was my own breathing. The forest is only quiet if you don't know what you're listening for, I reminded myself. I strained to hear, but it was truly silent. I swallowed hard but kept walking, pulling my infrared camera to my eyes every few minutes. It wasn't long before I came to the next deer a button buck in the same condition as the doe before him. This one had a significant difference though. He was still steaming. A twig snapped behind me and I twirled around, gun at the ready. I could see something in the underbrush, even though it was standing still. The rise and fall of its chest gave it away. It wasn't a wolf that much I knew. I crept toward it, pausing at each footfall. Through the tangle of trees I could make out its shape. It was tall, that was my first thought. Where I originally thought it had been standing upright, I could now see that it was crouched down on two legs, with long arms outstretched to either side holding it steady. I raised my gun to my shoulder and peered through my sight. With the renewed focus the sight provided, the rest became clear. The thing was a monster, a nightmare from my childhood made real. Long, curved claws stained red and brown emerged from human-like hands. Beady black eyes stared out from a furry, featureless face. Shaggy hair hung in lank waves over a thick, muscular body. I swallowed and steadied myself. I pulled the trigger and let out a breath of relief as the creature jerked back at the shoulder. It screamed, a terrible high-pitched wail that sounded nearly human in its agony, and shot back into the woods. It moved quickly through the trees whatever it was. Just a flash of a grey-brown pelt and a glimpse of long limbs. Every instinct I had told me to get out of the woods. To run away and never come back. But how could I face myself the next day, knowing that I'd injured a monster and left it to stalk these woods? How could I give in to my cowardice? I couldn't. I took a few deep breaths and walked over to where my bullet had ripped through the thing's shoulder. Blood splattered the brown leaves at my feet, as droplets trailed off in front of me. Just an animal I thought, I'll follow the trail of blood like I've done a million times before. I moved as quickly as I could manage without alerting the thing to my presence. Twice my foot fell on twigs that snapped, making me freeze until my eye could hear over the thundering of my heart. The creature, the monster, had moved fast. Soon enough the drops of red became more sparse. It had lost a lot of blood, but still it ran. I brought my infrared camera to my face and surveyed the forest around me. The trees were dense this far in, and I had little hope of seeing the thing hidden in the underbrush. The camera stripped the world of its color, turning the trees to grey sketches of themselves. As I scanned the area around me, a bright pulse of orange and red appeared to my right. It was a mound of color, its center dark purple through my camera lens. From what I could tell, it was no more than a few yards from me through trees. As I held my camera steady, the shape began to morph. It unfurled itself from its crouched position, standing to its full height. The orange figure cast an aura of color onto the colorless trees, but it didn't move. It stood still, and in the shifting colors I could tell that its chest was heaving. I stared at it, afraid to move, to give myself away. Through my scope it looked, human. It couldn't be though. The thing I trapped had been nothing short of monstrous. Had I lost its trail? Had I stumbled on another person out here? Who's there? I shouted into the trees, my voice wavering and unsure. That might have been the stupidest thing I'd ever done, I thought. But still, I couldn't risk shooting a person. I didn't have much time to consider it. The thing gave an inhuman shriek and bolted through the trees. That answered my question. I raised my rifle and got off a single shot. It ripped through the tree limbs but hit only air. Shit, I yelled. Before I knew what was happening, I was running through the woods. Not away from the thing like a normal sane person, but toward it. If it was running from me, it was scared. I had the upper hand. I could end this. It thrashed through the underbrush, its previous stealth forgotten. It was easy enough to follow. I ignored the persistent voice in my head telling me to turn back, to forget this thing and never return to these woods. Through my infrared camera, I saw its orange glow retreating through the trees. Even distorted through the lens its movements looked human. I dropped the camera back down to my chest and redoubled my pursuit. I knew it was the monster, it had to be. Its arms swung wildly, longer than any human arms. The camera was playing tricks on me, or the creature was. 
It didn't take long for me to gain ground on it. It was in front of me now, hunched and awkward in its movements. Its head twisted back around to look at me, furred face contorting into a grimace. It really was like something out of childhood stories The Wildman of the Woods. In the stories my grandmother told me, the wildman could tear its prey apart with bare hands. Instinctually I raised my rifle still gaining on the thing though slowed significantly. The creature let out an awful shriek and fell, tangled in its own feet and sprawling out over a rotten log. I lowered my rifle and ran to catch up, gaining the few yards quickly. The thing had turned over onto its back, staring up at me from the leaf-strewn ground. Its thick chest rose and fell rapidly. It was afraid. This clawed monster that had ripped deer and cattle apart like tissue paper was afraid. I licked my lips half in fear, half in anticipation of the kill, and raised my rifle to my shoulder. Please, the creature said, its voice cracking. I lowered my rifle. Before my eyes the thing shifted. Its face morphed like ripples clearing on a lake, changing from the wild men of my nightmares to a pincered bug to a panicked man, his face crumpled in pain and fear. Please, it whispered. I don't know what you are, but please don't hurt me again. There was a man before me dressed in hiking gear, his shoulders stained crimson red. He lay sprawled pitifully on the ground. What are you? I demanded. I'm a hiker, that's all. Please. No. I saw. I trailed off. It made no sense. The man sat up, pain passing over his expression. I raised my gun back to my shoulder. He didn't charge me, didn't make any move to attack. What are you? I asked again through gritted teeth. Please, I told you, came the reply. I don't know what you are, but please, I just want to go home. Something about the man's tone of voice softened my resolve. I thought about the hiker that they pulled out of these woods, about the monster he said he stabbed. I kept my rifle trained on his chest. If you are what you say you are, get up and leave. The man nodded and rose unsteadily to his feet and my gun rose to meet him. He shifted again, body changing from man to shaggy beast and back again. My finger trembled above the trigger. Leave, I yelled. I could hear the panic in my own voice and hoped that the man or beast or whatever the hell it was couldn't hear the same. The man bristled. I watched through my scope as he backed into the trees. When he was out of my sight, I lowered my rifle and let out a long breath. I raised my camera to my eyes and watched the figure of a man retreating through the trees. It was an hour or more before I turned to walk back out of the woods. I wish I could tell you that it all stopped, that Culver never found an eviscerated cow again. That hikers never wandered into those woods and hacked each other to pieces. That the forest service didn't shut it down after the deer all disappeared. But that would be a lie. I don't know what I saw in there. Hell, I don't know for sure that I saw anything. All I know is that I'll never go hunting again. I've been debating on whether to even mention this, it belongs in the ultra strange and weird category, but I do so in hopes that someone else may have seen or experienced something similar and will come forward to give their account. A few days ago I woke up and thought, now that was one weird dream. Well, at least that is what I keep telling myself. I'm not really sure if it was a dream or not. I was in bed asleep. I woke up suddenly to see an alien face peering down at me. I had just enough time to take note of its most outstanding features, think, wow, to myself, and then immediately drift back into slumber. Shortly after I woke up. I got up and went to the bathroom, then came back to bed, only to realize that there was blood on the bed. I checked myself and could find nothing amiss, no cuts, scratches or other means of bloodletting. I was bemused to say the least. I dressed, left my husband sleeping in bed and let the dogs outside. I then walked over to my cell phone and tried to wake it up, but it was dead. Now that might not seem like a problem, but when I went to bed, it had a full charge. When the battery died, the phone shut off and it wasn't going to turn on. I reached for my charge cable and plugged it into my phone, and when the battery icon appeared, it showed the phone had no charge at all. Coincidence. Okay so let's get this straight. I have a dream that may or may not have been a dream with an alien in my face, there was blood on my sheet and pillow and my fully charged phone was dead as a doornail. 
As for the alien it had bulging round fish-like eyes, gill slits where a nose would be, I saw the gills flare open as it exhaled when I opened my eyes, mottled green tinted white skin and knobs and a frill on the head. Hey it would make a good sci-fi movie alien. The thing is, that's pretty much what I saw. Later on in the day I noticed a tiny needle stick in the top of my right hand, made more noticeable due to bruising. I'm a UFO investigator. I investigate reports of UFOs and aliens. I'm not supposed to experience these things but then contact with something not of this earth, is the driving force behind my search for the truth. In my research as a UFO investigator, I've not been acquainted with fish-like aliens, so I did some checking and found that the Apkalu were a fish-like race that supposedly helped to advance the Sumerians of ancient Mesopotamia. There is a problem here. The Apkalu are depicted as being fish-like from the waist down i.e. merman. I only saw this chap from the neck up. Listed among the many supposed types of aliens that are here, visit Earth, or make an impact on human civilization are the amphibians. I could not determine what these beings possibly look like, but they are listed as semi-aquatic. Gills might be a good indication. Some researchers seem to think that greys have a cetacean ancestry. Or is it that serious reptilians with scales and gills lurk among us? Well this is all speculation and hopefully, it was just a silly dream, mixed with eerie coincidences. I was 23 years old in 1989 when I decided to move back to Pennsylvania from Florida. Back then I was a free-spirited female. I had no fear and true faith in God for my protection. I moved in with my brother on his fiancée in an old log cabin deep in the mountains in Lycoming County, Pennsylvania. My room was the attic in the cabin. I liked it because it was warm and at night could open the window that overlooked the porch for a cool breeze. There was a small trout stream that ran beside the cabin. It was perfect. I decided one day I was going to go out and explore the woods and I did it by myself. I found all kinds of blackberry bushes that were loaded with berries and decided to go out early in the morning and pick berries. I told my brother the next day that I wanted to go pick berries. He offered me his 357 Magnum for protection. He said berry bushes attract bears and I needed something for protection. I told him no thanks that God would protect me. I took a big paper grocery bag with me to pick berries and flowers. I looked to the sky and it started looking a little dark. The wind was picking up, but I was determined to go pick berries. I started from the back of the cabin and headed up through the waist-high weeds of the brush. I prayed to God for a bright sunny day. I began finding beautiful wildflowers, I was picking those and blackberries. I probably walked a couple of miles from the back of the cabin through the woods and fields across over a power line area, and felt like someone or something was watching me. I looked all around and saw two white tailed does in the grass under the power lines and thought, oh it was them watching me so I continued to cross, found another big blackberry bush, and began picking again. I didn't mention I had a walkman and listened to my loud music. Then suddenly I heard a growl that vibrated in my chest. I turned the walkman off, took my headset off, and listened I thought it may have been a black bear. I got a little scared and I prayed to God for protection. I looked all around and saw nothing. I walked around to the other side of the huge blackberry bush, and saw saliva hanging about three feet up on the leaves. I took a stick and checked. It was fresh, but I saw nothing looking out of the ordinary, so I continued with caution pushing through the woods. I had plenty of berries by this time and wildflowers too I came across this old cobblestone cabin that was in ruins. I sat down to smoke a cigarette. I looked up at the sky it had cleared. It was beautiful and sunny. Then I felt this tingling on my arm, almost like a ghost was watching me. Then something is asking me in my mind what I'm doing there. I said I came out to pick berries and flowers. Then it asked me where I was from. I told it I was from Florida, here visiting my brother. I could easily receive and send my answers with no problem. I thought at first it could have been an old civil war ghost. I told it I needed to head back home now and I left. We mind spoke for about an hour there at the old ruined cabin. On my way back I got very hot and sweaty, so I took my jacket and off tied around my waist. I heard something say in my mind to take my clothes off. I said no, I'll get all scratched up. It said because you don't have hair. 
I said yes, animals have hair to protect themselves. I began to become disoriented. I was hot, dizzy and lightheaded. I thought that I was lost. My dad was a hunter. He always told me if I got lost listen for water and find it, then follow the stream. You'll find your way back. I did and started following the stream. I knew the cabin was right beside the stream. I must have followed for a couple of miles. I was way out in those woods. I still felt dizzy, lightheaded, and a little nauseated. Finally I see in the cabin. This whole time I felt something or someone with me. When I saw the cabin I began to walk very fast towards it. I felt like all of my disorientation went away as soon as I walked in the cabin door. My brother's fiancé says, where the hell have you been? We were beginning to get worried about you. We had a really bad storm here with lightning half the day. I told her where I was it was beautiful and sunny. I went to get cleaned up. Then I went upstairs and put on my PJS, and it was getting dark by this time. I opened the window, sat on the roof and smoked a cigarette. I then went to sit down and brush my hair out at the vanity. I heard this huge thud like someone threw a brick on the roof by my bedroom window. I ran to see what caused the noise. While looking out that attic window I saw a red hairy something. It was no more than 4 feet from me. Its back was turned so I could only see its back I could see through the hair on its arms. It was white looking skin underneath. I didn't notice a cone shaped head. I couldn't really see a neck from the back. But its hair was like a thick lion's man from around the shoulders going into like a V. Let's say it was about 6 to 7 feet tall. It was slouched over facing away from me. It had hair on the back of its hands. I didn't see palms. I thought demon. What the hell is this thing? I took both hands to rub my eyes because I couldn't believe what I was seeing. When I removed my hands it was gone. It had disappeared. So I sat in the window still smoking a cigarette. That really shook me up. The next thing I hear two people outside talking. I strained my eyes I strained my ears to hear verbal speech. What was she doing way out there in the woods, I heard the other voice say, my sister visited. She was picking berries and flowers, she wasn't doing anything wrong. The other voice said, why do you let her come back, my brother said, I want her to know where she was going. I thought it was my brother talking to a visitor who had come to the cabin. I didn't hear a car pull up, though it's like a 5 mile dirt road on a rural country road. I became suspicious so I yelled, hey Ron? Who are you talking to? I said it several times and I began to hear this kind of language I couldn't understand. I've heard people say it sounds like samurai chatter. I'm going to say Cherokee sounding language. I then started yelling at the top of my voice. Run, run. My brother exited the house. He yells, what the hell's going on? I then knew it hadn't been my brother talking to someone. So I say, something just hit the roof of the house. It sounded like a brick. It was really loud. He runs into the cabin, gets a flashlight, shines it up at me sitting on the window sill, looks all around and sees nothing. He says, I don't see anything. He sounded a little upset from me yelling like that. He comes back to the cabin. Then his cat comes through the window. I'm petting the cat while lying on my bed. Ron comes up and yells at me for having the cat in the house. I told him it came in by itself. He made me put the cat back outside on the roof. I still leave the window open enough so a breeze can still come through. I began to hear the mind speak in my head asking me if my brother had a gun. I told it he had many big enough to blow a hole in you the size of a bowling ball. It questioned the word bowling ball so I used my hands to show the size. I felt like something or someone was in that room with me. I then turned the light out and went to bed. I woke up at 4.30 am with something literally drumming at the end of my bed. I opened my eyes. I was afraid at first but then upset for getting woke up. I yelled at whoever was doing it. I could not see anyone or anything. Then it did some more drumming. I told it to stop, it would wake everybody up in the cabin. I put my finger to my mouth like a gesture to be quiet. I think I made it mad so I apologized to whatever it was and asked it to please not hurt me. I then said a prayer for protection. I know it seems crazy but I swear to you this happened. I've heard native people say that they, Bigfoot, can bond with you, and that you will always communicate with them. I'm in Texas now. I went back to Pennsylvania in 2016 to have neck surgery. I decided to go see my brother. 
He has his own place now about seven miles from that cabin. I was there by myself the second day and I felt this overwhelming feeling of fear. I can't describe how I was shaking inside. I heard a loud thud outside on the porch. I knew right away that it was my Bigfoot friend. I turned all the inside lights out but a few and turned the porch lights on. My brother arrived 40 minutes later. The overwhelming fear I had felt went away right away. I went to bed on the pull-out sofa sleeper. As soon as I turned the lights out and got into bed, five minutes later the whole metal frame of the bed bent down at the end and I slid out. I pulled the mattress off and slept by the pellet stove on the floor. I began to hear my mind speak asking me about my neck. I believe that Bigfoot are interdimensional beings and have a language. I believe that they can cloak somehow, where they can be right in front of you and you can't see them. I believe they change their frequencies somehow to do this. I have a story about the not deer from two summers ago. I lived deep in the Appalachian Mountains in Tennessee at the time, unlike the foothills I'm in now. I was wandering in the woods probably two-thirds of a mile from my house at that point, as one does when they live two miles down a twisting dirt road with the nearest town, and therefore things to do 30 minutes away when I heard brush moving. I knew it was probably a harmless animal, a possum, or a deer, maybe a particularly destructive rabbit, and I turned to look. It was a deer. It was about 30 feet away from me staring. Wild deer don't stare at random people to begin with. They just ran away. This doe was breathing hard and making a low rumbling sound. I didn't really know what to do, and I hadn't really thought about the dangers of going near wild animals, even if they are, harmless deer, so I went towards her. I swear to God, this thing's eyes blanked out, and it took a couple jerking steps forward, moving really strangely. And I flinched, and then she ran off to the side while staring at me until she was about 50 feet away. It was deeply unsettling in a way that I can't explain, and I know that that thing was not quite a deer. I sprinted all the way home. I would say that the joints went the wrong way. The bends were not where the bends go. And the shape of the face and head was wrong, more in the shape of a dog. It was just very odd looking, and the way it reacted to me was disturbing. I started to walk away, but the doe followed me for about two miles on the trail. It stayed at a distance of about 50 feet. After about 45 minutes of this, she suddenly disappeared. I have family that still live in the mountains, and they have described a variety of strange things. But the not deer is one phenomenon that they don't like to discuss. In 2015 some friends of mine and I decided to experience a past life regression. We didn't take it seriously at all. Plus I believe in an Abrahamic religion, so I never even consider reincarnation as a viable option. Anyway, while I was doing the guided meditation, I appeared as a greenish reptilian being. I could only see my legs as there were no mirrors around, I had backward knees, two long toes, and a thumb like one. I won't go into incredible detail here, unless you want me to but basically, I saw their planet dying, Earth and its beginning and finally getting betrayed and killed by being pushed out of a ship. I joked about it with my friends and didn't think about it anymore. Sometime later I had a vivid, weird dream that included some men in suits and hats attach me to some type of machine. The second dream I had was completely normal until the end. I was around a supermarket with a friend of mine, unaware of being in a dream when someone from a different room started screaming. Everyone around me, my friend included, started staring at me and saying, they are looking for you. At that point, I became aware of my dream and I followed the scream. I entered a room where a guy with completely black eyes did nothing but scream, your bread. English isn't my first language, I live in Switzerland so I didn't understand initially and the more I misunderstood the louder he would scream. When I got that the word was bread and not bread, I woke up. Another one I had soon after, I was in an empty room with only a TV in the middle. I was with a bunch of other people I didn't know, and a voice screamed that everything we dreamed about was real and our first test was to wake up in 60 seconds or we were going to die. Everyone was panicking but many people managed to wake up. I was able to as well, but then I fell asleep immediately after and the countdown was still running so I woke up for good. Anyway, I have had many incidents like this. 
the fact is that I can always tell when I'm going to get these dreams because my whole body starts shaking, and I can feel myself as if I'm flying away from it. After all of this, I couldn't get myself to believe any of it until recently when I read that other people know about the reptilian beings, I don't know what to think to be honest. This incident happened in October 1973. It was a common occurrence for my mother and I to observe strange objects in the air that looked like nothing we had ever seen. Triangular objects that would stop and start randomly. More circular objects that would move vertically as well as horizontally. It seemed as if they were performing for us. It was explained to my mother that they were experimental aircraft from the Air Force Base in Columbus, Mississippi. We looked forward to our entertainment. One fall evening my parents were in the house and I was outside alone. I wandered several hundred yards behind our house and felt heard and saw simultaneously a large cigar or blimp shaped object. A fat cigar or skinny blimp. It was a dull pewter color. Then it emitted a white light down. The craft was not on the ground but hovered just below tree level. I was drawn to the light and had a feeling of total comfort almost euphoria. I have no idea how I got there, but I came to a room with no windows, there were no lights, but it was very bright. There were three male and one female human-like people there. The men looked like super athletes close to seven feet tall. Blonde hair, blue eyes which were a little larger than normal. The clothing was plain, but skin tight, and almost appeared to be painted on. The woman was a few inches shorter and very curvy. I was only 10 years old but I immediately had a feeling of comfort, trust, and even attraction to her. As I was looking around, I had no discomfort. All I could move was my eyes and head. They touched me, had something like a wand, and went all around me with it. The entire time we communicated but didn't talk. It was primarily them telling me the evils of nuclear power or weapons, and to always do all I could to stay away from and stop its use. They also told me that they would be watching after me and mine. Not to worry, I would always be taken care of. Over the next few years I had communication with them, but it was a less vivid memory. I would be asleep, have almost a feeling of a dream I was aboard, then wake up in a chair outside. I always felt great after these visits. I found myself looking forward to these. I told my mother after the first and every other encounter I had. She told me that she believed me, and that it could be real, or could be a dream but convinced me not to tell anyone else because they would not understand and it would make life hard on me. Some time later I noticed a 2-3 centimeter hard object just under the skin on my left outer mid thigh. I have asked several doctors but have had no explanation on what it is. I have had spontaneous pneumothorax collapsed lung for no apparent reason 5 times as a teenager. No problems since. I put this repressed or did not think that this could be real as these were not bad experiences, and were not like aliens that I have read about. I did a search on the internet to find a movie, and a picture of the type of people that took me came up. That is when I have had a flood of these memories return. I have a great life, I am a successful eye doctor in Jackson, Mississippi with a wonderful healthy family. I just felt compelled to report this. I have an account that is unbelievable and deeply frightening. I'm currently in my 10th week of recovery after enduring a shattered leg and the details are as follows. I reside in the heart of the Haugelfels in Cumbria, UK where rolling hills seamlessly merge with sporadic woods and limestone features and give way to miles of unexplored cave systems. In the past year while walking in the fields with my dogs, I noticed a disturbing trend, an increasing number of dead livestock. These animals have been torn apart by a force much larger than them, with some carcasses scattered over 50 feet. One particularly bizarre discovery was finding the remains of a sheep more than 30 feet up in a tree. This feat is not within the capabilities of sheep around here. My curiosity led me to the woodland where I found the tree sheep, and about three months later I experienced something truly unnerving in the woods close to sunset. My dog stood still growling while a potent odor of mushrooms and urine permeated the air. Silence enveloped everything replacing the usual symphony of birds and bleeding lambs. Then suddenly a large bipedal creature that was emitting the scent sprinted away from me. Both dogs gave chase but only one returned. 
Despite my efforts I've never been able to locate the missing dog. It's not normal for dogs to go after them, but they do sometimes and usually end up with the same fate. Having faced danger in Afghanistan, Iraq and the Ukraine this encounter terrified me like never before. From that point on I always carried my 12-gauge shotgun through the woods. I also secretly possess an old Lee Enfield 303 gifted by my grandfather for dire circumstances. The police would not look favorably on me if I was caught. Ten weeks ago I returned to the woods and the eerie events repeated. My dog exhibited signs of distress, growling intermittently. The familiar odor lingered mixed with a Swedish pine scent. I spotted a creature roughly seven feet tall with tan-colored hair, darker areas on its body, and a mouth covered in blood. At its feet feet lay a three-legged sheep that still seemed to be breathing. Believing that a shot from my 12 gauge would scare the creature away allowing me to humanely finish off the injured sheep, I fired knowing full well that at 40 meters away the shot would be completely ineffective. However my actions triggered a larger creature higher up the slope to push a boulder toward me. Attempting to dodge it I fell backward and the boulder rolled over my thigh resulting in 4 clean breaks and 34 fractures. The memory of making my way back off the fell is non-existent. A friend informed me that I was found six hours later after my dog alerted him. I had to be airlifted to the hospital and I owe my life to my loyal companion. Only a select few are privy to the truth of the story, as I fear the narrow-minded public would dismiss me as mad regrettably. I don't own a mobile phone to document these events, but I kicked myself for not having a camera with me at the time. What I witnessed was truly unbelievable particularly here in the UK. However, over the past years, my mind has been open to all sorts of possibilities. So I regularly browse my Craigslist, missed connections page at work because they're often really cute or really creepy, and either way it's entertaining. Basically people post about other people they've passed on the street, or briefly talked to, and they regret not getting their information so they try to connect over this forum. Normally it's like, we talked in the parking lot of Sprouts, I'd love to take you out. If it was you, tell me what I was wearing. However, I was on it today while at lunch, and I found a post that said paraphrased, I caressed you and touched your bare torso from behind. I told you I would get a tattoo to remember that moment, because that is when I fell for you. You clenched up when I told you that. I have feelings for you. I will hunt you forever. Wasn't about me, but gave me the creeps who describes courting someone as, hunting. Anyway, I link the post. If you guys haven't checked out your local Missed Connections page on Craigslist, I would highly recommend it for some creeps. Who knows? You might even be on it. Man tried to pay me 12 mail $20 to get in his car. This happened in the early to mid 1980s. I was about 12 and had a group of friends that I hung out with regularly. I lived in Kenner, Louisiana. Anyway there was this fad back then to open these teen nightclubs. No alcohol disco music and the same vibe as the cocaine induced frenzy of adult disco clubs. Anyway one was opening up. My friends couldn't stop talking about it. I hate crowds but I was a follower in my group so I agreed to go with everybody. One of our parents dropped us off, we paid our $2 to get in. I can see that it's super crowded shoulder to shoulder. I kinda just hung out around the front door debating whether or not I was gonna stay. After 10 or 15 minutes pass, I get this feeling like someone's watching me. Just an eerie creepy vibe. So I just start looking around there's a lot of people so it's like a blur. Then I notice this middle aged guy, short brown hair, striped collared shirt. He's just starting at me like he knows me or something. Well I knew I didn't know him, and that was my cue to leave. It was about a 5 mile walk down a well lit, semi busy 2 lane highway then right, and another couple miles down a 4 lane road into the subdivision. It's only about 8pm, and I don't have to be home till midnight so I had time to walk it. So I take off walking. And I guess about halfway home this car pulls up on a side road that I was crossing, and it's the same guy from the nightclub. My heart starts pounding out of my chest. He creeped me out around 200 people. I was really creeped out on an isolated side street by myself. He yells at me and asks if I want a ride. It's pretty far but f that. 
lol, I said no and kept walking. Then he yells at me, yeah wanna make an easy $20, and I'm dumb. I stop and ask, how, he says, get in the car and I'll tell ya. Nope. I just bolted. I took off and I don't think I've ever ran that fast in my entire life. I ran the last 3 miles full speed without stopping, and without looking back. I made it home, ran inside the house and straight to my room. I didn't even think to look back to see if he was following me, but if he came here at least my dad was in the living room. I never told anybody. I really think I was one dumb move away from being on a milk carton. Or worse. Did I accidentally become a horror story? I bought a beat up old Broyhill Brasilia dresser from a lady in Hollywood. Paid in cash organized the whole thing via text. I could tell she was sad to see it go, but it needed a lot of work and I love that kind of furniture. A few weeks later I finished restoring it, and it looked beautiful. I was super proud of it and sent her a photo of the completed work with another thank you for selling me the piece in the first place. I never heard back. Was that creepy of me? Whoops. It was a quiet evening in the small town of Riverton, and my friend Jake was on the lookout for a good deal on a computer. He had been searching online when he stumbled upon a seemingly incredible offer on Craigslist. The ad promised a high-performance computer at a fraction of the market price, and Jake couldn't resist the temptation. The seller who went by the username techwis 77 agreed to meet in a deserted parking lot on the outskirts of town. Eager to score a fantastic deal, Jake arrived at the meeting spot, a sense of excitement mixed with a hint of caution. The setting sun cast long shadows across the empty lot as he approached a figure standing next to a nondescript van. Techwis 77 a middle-aged man with a scruffy beard, greeted Jake with a nod. As they discussed the details of the transaction, a chill ran down Jake's spine. Something felt off, but he brushed it aside, attributing it to the eerie atmosphere of the deserted location. Moments later, just as the exchange was about to take place, a dark figure emerged from the shadows demanding money. Panic set in as the situation escalated into a tense confrontation. The mysterious figure, face concealed by a hoodie, brandished A45, demanding Jake hand over his wallet. Fear gripped Jake, and he hesitated for a moment, torn between complying and making a run for it. Before he could make a decision, a gunshot echoed through the air, and a searing pain erupted in Jake's stomach. He crumpled to the ground, clutching his wounded abdomen, the computer transaction now a distant memory. In the chaos that ensued, the assailant fled, leaving Jake writhing in pain. Fortunately, a passerby had witnessed the incident and called 911. Within minutes the sound of sirens filled the air as an ambulance rushed Jake to the hospital. I had some baby scooters lying around outside the front of my apartment that the kids weren't riding anymore, so I thought I'd post them up for free to a good home. I spoke to a woman via text and gave her my address. I waited all evening for her to come and she never showed. Around midnight I heard a car pull in near the front of my apartment, but didn't think too much of it because cars always came and went. I did happen to look out my window and saw a red VW Beetle pulling out. The next day I went outside to find not only were the free scooters missing, but my daughter's brand new tricycles they got for Christmas, a laundry hamper full of towels and rags that I had put outside so I could clean the next day, my husband's dolly, and some other odds and ends. All of the those things were in a completely separate location from where the free scooters were which means she snooped around my property quickly and quietly and helped herself to all my belongings. She knew exactly what was for free because of the picture and our conversation we had earlier. I tried messaging her and she'd never reply. Finally she replied and said she couldn't make it the night before, and she doesn't want them anymore and she's not coming. I was livid. A couple days later I typed her phone number into Craigslist and found ads for her yard sales she has every weekend. I drove by the address given and right there in her yard were all of my belongings. I called the police and they said I had no proof, but they would drive by and ask. But if she says she didn't take them then they have to leave it at that. I tell my mother-in-law about it and she decides to take matters into her own hands. 
her gangster ass grandma self and her sister roll up to this lady's yard sale. They approach her and say, you stole my son's belongings and point out exactly what they are. The woman denies it. This is when my mother-in-law gets really gangster lol. She starts walking up and down the street with her sister screaming. This woman's a thief. She stole my son's belongings and stole two tricycles from two little girls. Just screaming it for the entire neighborhood to hear. People start coming outside to view the spectacle that was unfolding. The thief chases my mother-in-law down and says shhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhh